Now, I heard Mark talking this morning, and understand this, we're all, mankind is under common grace. You know why we're under common grace? Because at the time when God destroyed the world by flood, and he had Noah put his family in the ark, there was room for others, and, 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 and the animals that God directed him to bring in. It was that after Noah had got out of the ark, he offered a sacrifice to the Lord and offering a sacrifice to the Lord of these animals. These are the only land-breathing animals on the face of the earth. And he took the clean ones and offered them as a sacrifice to the Lord. And God's heart was so moved that he said, I'm never going to destroy the man again by flood. And he said, I'm going to read about in Genesis 6, 8, and 9. And he said, I'm going to put my bow in the sky that I am reminded of the covenant that I'm making with man. You see, the bow in the sky is not reminding us. It should remind us. But God said, I'm putting the bow in the sky that I'm reminded of the covenant that I'm making with man. Because he said man will continue to be wicked. Man will continue. And from that time, this world has been living under common grace. It's the grace and the favor of God. That's why the scripture says the sun comes on the just and the unjust. But if you come under his special grace, when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, when you put your heart and you open your life to him and say, I want you in my life. I want you to be the center of everything that I'm doing. That is that you'll make him the Lord of your life. That is that you'll allow the word of God to get into your heart. That is that you'll obey the word of God and as you obey the word of God, More of his power is released within your life. What happens is that as you begin to do that, you're under special grace. Who knows this special grace? I've been praying that God will give give a special grace in this season with his servant, Bishop Dag Hewitt Mills. That God will give a special grace upon us. That the word will explode. Everybody say it. The word will explode in the hearts of men and women because of the miraculous demonstration of God's power. When there's a miraculous demonstration of God's power, his word explodes in the hearts of men and women. You see, last week we baptized some young people in water. And Jesus said these words. I should go to Deuteronomy first, shouldn't I? So let's go to Deuteronomy 28. Because I want to show you what can happen when you come under special grace. And he said, it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obeyed the voice of the Lord your God. Now that's to the nation of Israel. When I was very sick 36 years ago, I lost two things. I was in such terrible pain. And the two things that I'd lost a consciousness of was his presence because I was in such pain. And I couldn't hear his voice. I was so confused in my mind. All my life as a young man and coming up to that point, I knew the comfort, the joy, the the security of his presence in my life. It's not that I felt him with me every day, but I knew he was with me. But there are times in prayer, in times in praise, in times in my relationship that his presence was manifest and it was such a security to me. I, I, I by the grace of God, I live with a, a, a sharp ear to hear what it is what the Lord would say to me because the scripture says this very clearly. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. And what he hears, if he's listening, More shall be added to him. But if he's not listening, what he has will be taken from him. And so I trained my ear to hear what it is that the Lord would say to me personally in my life and in the relationship to what it is that he wanted me to do as your pastor and to lead you into that which he wanted us to do. And I haven't done it. We've done it together. And we'll continue to do it together. But as a shepherd, I'm to lead. I'm to feed. I'm to lead and I'm to protect you. The only way I can feed you is that you come within the sound of my voice. The only way I can lead you is to get close to me and follow me. The only way I can protect you is to hang around. If you don't do any of those, I can't help you. 
And we would look into the scripture, these two things. And I remember I was in such pain. I said to my wife, for just a little sidebar of one illustration, I said, I can't, I can't, I haven't got a sense of his presence anymore. And I can't hear his voice. And there's so much confusion in my pain, in my mind. There's so much confusion. And I can't hear his voice. So I used to, uh, a, a, a precious uh, widow woman, let us, we didn't have much money in those days, let us stay in a house in Harvey Bay. And so I'd get up. In, in, in early in the morning and I'd start to uh, open the Bible and I'd start to read it out loud, read it out loud to myself and I'd read the Psalms and I'd read uh, the book of Ephesians and I'd read the book and I'd read it out loud and the reason that I was reading it out loud is that I believed in the power of his word and I began to hear his voice and I began to feel his presence and I felt safe. When I've got to the place of hearing his voice and feeling his presence, I was now I was going to come through because I knew by experience he was with me. When people come to this house, I want them to be aware of his presence. When people come to this house, I want them to hear his voice. The word of God makes it very clear to us as we look into the scriptures. And Jesus said it, Mark 16, 16. Have a look at this. He said, the, he, said he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Can I ask the question, what if a person believes, what will they do? Mark 16, 16. Is it on the board behind me? Mark 16, 16. If a person is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, what will they do? Oh, that's an easy question for you, isn't it? So notice that Jesus said this, he that believeth and is what? Baptized Baptized shall be what? Saved. And then he goes on to tell us um, in this passage of Scripture, and these signs shall follow them who what? The signs shall follow who? How do we know if a person believes? Because they've been baptized. How do we know if a person believes? Because they've been baptized. And if you've been baptized, certain signs shall follow you who have been baptized. But you're leaving it to me. You're leaving it to Bishop Dag. When I heard the testimony of our sister, when she was in such pain, and she said to her hubby, will you pray for me? And he prayed for her, and she slept beautifully. And then she went back to the doctor and got checked out. Have you ever thought of praying for one another? You call me when you're suddenly not recovering. You call the elders of the church. There are ministries that are apostles and prophets and pastors, and not all are workers of miracles. Not all have the gifts of healings. But every believer can lay hands upon the sick, and they shall recover. God wants his word to explode. Everybody say, God wants his word to explode. The reason that his word will explode is that men and women believe it, and they're acting upon it. Jesus said it, these signs shall follow them that believe. Even though you read that scripture out of Deuteronomy 2, you in 28, 1 and 2, they're the promises about keeping the word. Everybody say, keeping the word. You see, there are believers today, they have the miraculous and they've been released and so, but, but it's the word that has power. And when the word increases, when the word multiplied, the word will prevail, things will begin to happen in people's lives. We just, some people just want to live from one week to next week of the miraculous. But the miraculous will, the miraculous brought us to the place of knowing the reality of who Jesus is and what he's done. The miraculous brought us to the place that now that God would also, in having us at that place, hear his word. That we might act upon it. That we would be blessed. Everybody say, I'm going to get blessed. (laughs) Have you ever considered Solomon? We're into the book of Kings. And if you're doing devotionals with me, and you're following along the line of, you'll be with me. You're in the book of Kings. And Solomon, God gave him wisdom, but what a foolish man. He had so many women in his life that they turned his heart from following God. And as much as God had given him wisdom and all these wives and concubines that I think he had 700 wives. My Lord Jesus, 700 mother-in-laws. That'd be pretty tough, wouldn't it? (laughs) 
It, because you've got to please the mother-in-law if you've got a wife. Isn't that, isn't that true? You don't believe me? I had a wonderful mother-in-law, but boy, I tell you. 700 mother-in-laws. God have mercy. But the reality is, the reality is that Solomon, all his wisdom, didn't keep God's word. His heart was divided. When he died, his kingdom was divided. In other words, if you look into the word of God, and you'll find at times when Joash, a boy who came to the throne at the age of eight, and the, the king of uh, Judah, you will find that as he began to grow and they began to cleanse the temple of all the foreign idols, <coughs> excuse me, they found the book of Deuteronomy. And as he began to read the book of Deuteronomy, they realized they were not obeying the word. Everybody say, I want the word to explode. I want the word to multiply. And I want it to happen in me. So it is as I look into the word of God, would you please understand about the miraculous? Come with me for a moment in this passage of Scripture. Come with me to uh, um, uh, uh, the book of uh, Luke, please, if you would. I hope it's Luke, because um, I feel directed of the Lord to do this. Um, it might be Mark, so bear with me. Everybody say, we do, Pastor, every Sunday. <laughs> if you come with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, you will find that Jesus came walking on the water with his, to his disciples at the fourth hour of the night. They thought he was a ghost. They, they, were, they saw him walking on the water. They were troubled and immediately took with them and said, uh, it's me, be of good cheer, uh, do not be afraid. I'd imagine that the Lord might show up in these meetings with Bishop Dag Hewitt Mills and I can imagine that people will get a shock. I imagine that some people will get a little afraid. And Jesus doesn't come to make you afraid. But his manifestation of his presence and his spirit could make you feeling a little afraid. Because he loves you. And when you find sometimes, have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that way? I find in the scriptures, every now and then when the Lord gets close to me, I get a little nervous. Not all the time. But there are times, and I'm so glad I do because, you know, I'm flesh. I mean, if you look at the scripture, he says to his disciples, don't be afraid. John saw him in the Isle of Patmos, and he fell at his feet as dead. When's the last time that you felt the presence of God so close, so near to you, that you got a little edgy? If you haven't, at any time in your life, you haven't got close enough yet. He's got close to you, but you've got to get close to him. And you've got to recognize that this will happen. So when he got into the boat, he said to his disciples, look at this passage of scripture, he said, for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. Do you think it's possible that Jesus' disciples had a hard heart? Do you think that in being around Jesus all the time, uh, it's possible that, I mean, I mean, the first time I read this, I thought to myself, you're kidding me. They had a hard heart. When they saw Jesus cleansing the leper, when they saw Jesus making the blind men to see, when they saw all these wonderful things that they were doing, you're responsible for your heart. It's amazing. It's amazing. The hardness of the heart is very dangerous. Do you know what can harden the heart? The things that provoke us, the things, the provocations in our lives. And the Bible says, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Everybody say it with me. You've got to guard your heart. For out of it are the issues of life. But come with me in this other passage of Scripture because it's so very important in, in Mark chapter 8. When Jesus had um, uh, fed the multitude and uh, there were seven basketfuls left over, um, um, the, the Scripture says that um, um, he hopped into a boat or he, in, in, in verse, and there were 4,000 men. Have a look in verse 10. And immediately got into the boat with his disciples and came to the region, the particular region. And the Pharisees came out, began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. Even though the miraculous are happening, I want you to know I won't let people get too close to dispute with Bishop Dag Hewitt Mills. I will guard him. Because there might be some who think that they can come after seeing miracles, after what he's preached, wanting to dispute with him. You won't get past me. The religious ones will want to dispute. Are you religious? Do you dispute with me in your minds after I preach the word of God? Ivan goes home with his wife every Sunday with, uh, where are you, free? And they discuss the word. They don't have pasta for lunch. They have the word for lunch. 
Isn't that true, Pastor Ivan? Are you disputing? What's the condition of your heart? God is going to bring a man into our midst who's mightily anointed. Is your heart getting ready to receive what God wants to do for you? Ask the question. Who wants God to do something for them? Who wants the word of God to explode in their hearts? I mean, who wants the word of God to increase? Who wants the word of God to multiply? Who wants the word of God to prevail? Oh, you've got to want it. See, it's interesting, as you look into this passage of Scripture, and so he sighed deeply. Oh, imagine Jesus. Oh, no. Here are these people, these religious people. What does this generation seek a sign? Why does it? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. Then he left and got into the boat and departed the other side. And the disciples had forgotten to take bread. And they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. And he charged them saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of Pharisees and the, uh, the, the leaven of Herod. In other words, he was saying, beware of their teaching. Have you ever heard any wrong teaching where somebody's come up to you and said, beware of their teaching? Do you know that not every spirit's of God? I won't allow anybody to come in this pulpit. There's one thing, I have a great board. And I want you to know that we together work together in everything. There's one thing I guard as my sovereign right and sole right who works in this pulpit, who stands here. That's nobody's decision but mine. And I won't surrender it to anybody. Do you understand? Not every spirit's of God. I remember years ago, I had a guest speaker preaching for me, and after he left, there was nothing but trouble in the church. And I couldn't understand it. I thought he was good. I thought what he said was good. And so I remember um, thinking, oh, well, you know, maybe I'm just out of sync or something's not quite right. So anyway, I, I let it be. And, uh, then, and then he was coming back to Australia and somebody said, oh, you're going to have so-and-so. I said, yeah, we had him before, but I don't know. Um, yeah, okay, we'll have him. He's a real man of God and everybody said, and you know, he's got a wonderful gifting in his life. So we had him in our church and after he left, I had nothing but trouble in the church. People were unsettled. People were arguing with one another and going on and arguing with me. So I said, I don't know. I don't know what they understand. So I had him one more time. In fact, I told my wife, I said, so-and-so's coming back into the nation. We're going to have him again. And she said, you're not, are you? She said, yeah. I said, look, there's something not right. I've got to find out what it is. Everybody say he's fabulous. So I brought him into our house again. When he left, there was nothing but trouble. I said, Jesus, I don't understand. So I went to a, I was young in those days. So I went to a, a, a minister friend of mine. And I said, this is the situation. What do you think? He said, oh, it's his spirit. He said, what? He said, it's his spirit. What he's saying is correct, but his heart's not right. And it's his spirit that's affecting the people. As soon as I saw it, I knew what he was talking about. Jesus said, my words are spirit and life. He had words, but wrong spirit. Do you know that you can have a good heart, but a wrong head? And God can get those people on track. But if you've got a right head and a wrong heart, you're in serious trouble. What does Jesus ask you to guard? Your heart. Guard your heart. So when God begins to encroach upon your life and speak to your life, he usually will challenge your thinking. If he challenges your thinking, just check your heart is in the right condition. Because God, some of our thinking is stinking thinking, and it's wrong. And God's going to cut across it. Everybody say, God's going to cut across our thinking. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. It's the thinking that's the problem, but you've got to guard your heart. And when God begins to speak to you and speak to you about things, your heart's got to be open and ready to receive. I've been praying for you that you'd have an open heart, that you'd have no prejudices, no racial prejudice against this black man that's coming from Africa. No racial prejudices, um, no, no, no prejudice in, in any area at all in your lives. Not that I think you have, but I certainly don't want you to have any. But you be receptive to be receiving him and to open your heart, because I trust him. I have my best friend, David Sumrall, coming from Sumrall. Uh, David Sumrall coming from Manila. He's coming. He trusts him. 
Our hearts have got to be open. Everybody say our hearts have got to be opening. So listen to what he says. Take heed of the teaching. And they reasoned said, we have no bread. What are you saying this? Because we have no bread. And Jesus being aware of it, the scripture says, what do you reason they have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Is your heart still hardened? Do you know that, that you can have wrong thinking, but if the condition of the heart is such, that's why the Bible talks about the double-minded man. Everybody say the double-minded man. Your heart and your mind are in conflict. Your heart and your mind are in conflict. And the double-minded man, he is an unstable person. Everybody took to somebody and said, there's nobody unstable around here. <laughs> But when your heart and mind are in conflict, and so he says here, how is it that you don't understand? Why is it that you don't perceive? Having eyes you do not see, having ears you do not hear. Do you not remember when I broke the 5,000, uh, uh, when I broke the five loaves to the 5,000? How many basketfuls did you take up? 12. And also when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many fragments did you take up? They said, he said, how is it that you don't understand? Who's he talking to? Who's he talking to? Who's he talking to? He's talking to his... Who's he talking to? He's talking to his disciples. He's talking to his hand-picked 12. He said, how come you don't understand? You know you can be with Jesus and not understand what he's saying? That's a terrible thought, isn't it? I can be with Jesus and still have a hard heart. There are two things, remember I said to you in the beginning of the service, and that is there's two things that I require in my life, that I recognize his presence and I hear his voice. So I know what he's saying to me. It's not a, an assu- not a big enough assurity if I don't hear his voice. Come with me to another passage of scripture in Mark chapter 16. And in Mark chapter 16, the Bible tells us these wonderful stories. And you know the story of, of the resurrection. But the Bible says after that, he appeared to, uh, in, uh, in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and he told it to the rest, but they did not believe him either. And later he appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table and rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. If the Lord brought correction to your life, could you handle it? If the Lord wanted to speak to you because he loved you and he wanted to bring correction to your life, could you handle it? the Lord wanted to say something to you, do you think when the Lord's bringing correction, he wants to crush you? Please say no. Oh, please. When the Lord wants to bring correction to your life, is he, is he trying to crush you or belittle you or, 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 or trying to um, uh, speak about, you know, that some way that you're not good enough for him? He's not thinking like that at all. But what he wants to do is he wants to address issues within our lives so that faith might be released to believe. Hardness of heart. And so it is that you need to recognize and to know that in me speaking to you today, when the miraculous began to take place, remember, Jesus could do no mighty miracles in his hometown. Why? Why couldn't Jesus do any mighty miracles? Hey, no, Jesus couldn't do any mighty miracles because there was no honor. Their hearts were hard, but there was no honor. Come with me to Mark, please, chapter 6. Hear what the Lord says here in this passage of Scripture. That thing's gone off and I've got to watch it. But in Mark chapter 6, look at this. They they, they were astonished at this man. He began to teach in the synagogue. And where did he get this wisdom from? Verse 3. This is not the the carpenter. In fact, it was one of our people who said just recently, you know, we're getting cancer packs ready for the people in the cancer ward. We're going to tell you about that in a couple of weeks. It's going to cost us about $3,000 providing they're just about all gone and people are just so moved by the fact that we, the Cathedral of Praise, make these packages and they just, don't they, Lindell, they just absolutely love them and we don't blow our trumpet about it but I'm telling you because I want you to get blessed because this is what we as a church is doing. 
Linda was telling them about Bishop Dag Lewis and they were just, oh. And then she said, you know, he's a registered doctor. And they started to listen. He's not a fool. But the says of Jesus, they took offense at him. And the Bible says, oh, they were offended. Look at the verse. And he said, Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own, uh, 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 not without honor, except in his own country, among his own relatives, his own house. And he could do no mighty miracles there. Why, except heal a few sick folk. And the Bible says he marveled at their unbelief. The real basis for unbelief that there was a lack of honor. Do you know who we're bringing into our midst? Are you ready? I'm trying to prime you. I'm trying to get you ready. Mark and I are ready. Mark said to me yesterday, he said, man, I'm so glad I saw him when I was with you in Manila. Oh, man, am I so excited. Oh, man, if I hadn't been to Manila, well, I, would, well, 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 I don't know what I would be feeling. And many of you haven't seen. Brett's sat with me under his ministry. Mark's been with me. Well, Simon, you've been with me. Where are you? Um, I, it was to Simon I said, the first time I saw, heard him preach, Simon was sitting with me in Manila. I said, how do you think he'd go in our church? And Simon said, are we ready for him? <laughs> That's what Simon's response was. And I said, I'm ready. I'm ready. He's going to come to you and you want to just begin to pray. Will you make room in your heart to receive what it is that God has for you? You see, we can make God marvel in faith or we can make God marvel in unbelief. Do you reckon? Have you ever noticed this in the scripture? That, that uh, in, in this scripture, the, the Bible tells us that the Bible says Jesus marveled at people's unbelief. He, why don't you believe? Marveled. He wondered at their unbelief. Well, you can make him marvel because you believe his word. Turn with me, please, to Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew chapter 8, the word of God tells us here in this passage of scripture uh, that uh, he, he came to a centurion, came to Jesus and uh, a soldier and he had a hundred men under him and he said, I've got a servant's paralyzed and um, Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. He said, oh, you know, I'm not worthy. He's not in the sense of he's not worthy. He realized who Jesus was and he, he, he so honored the Lord. You, but I, be, and, and, and I know you have authority and the reason that he so honored the Lord and felt that he wasn't worthy. (laughs) But he said, if you just speak the word, 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 I saw this man speak the word and people with breast cancer were healed. And they had nurses and doctors on the platform checking them. I saw a person just speaking the word and an 87-year-old deaf grandmother, her ears were opened and she heard her grandchildren for the first time in seven years. Simon, we saw it with our own eyes and heard it. And this servant said, if you'll but just speak the word, if he speaks a word, are you going to receive it? Speak the word. And listen to this, beloved. I tell you, the miracles that we've had in our church just the last couple of weeks, it should be the tip of the point. Do you know why the disciples' hearts were hard? Because they weren't celebrating the miracles that Jesus did. He said, I did this miracle and I fed these many and I took up this many loaves and I did this miracle, fed this many. How is, it you, how is it you don't understand? Jesus knew the condition of their heart was they're not contemplating and thinking and meditating on and opening their hearts to, wow, God is a miracle working God. But look at this in Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus said, He heard it. He marveled. Wow. He said, I haven't found such faith like this in all of Israel. This is amazing. What's going to cause you to marvel? Him to marvel at your unbelief or believing his word. Stand together with me. I want the word of God to grow. 
I want the Word of God to increase. I want the Word of God to multiply because there's power in His Word. 